Hi, all right. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. We can hear you really well. Now, I was saying that behind, is it an, um, an Apple II computer? Yeah, <laughs> Mac, or Macintosh SE. Yeah, Macintosh, yeah, nice, nice, really nice. Uh, yeah, Aaron, you have uh, 30 minutes, uh, 25 minutes plus questions uh, yep. with the audience. Uh, are you able to share your screen? Let's find out. That's the most, the technical moment. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah, with a big OAuth uh, logo there. Great. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah. So let's have uh, Aaron uh, present us. Thank you, Aaron, for being here. What's new in OAuth 2.1? Aaron, the stage is yours for uh, 25 minutes. All right, thank you very much. Thanks for the intro. Uh, hi, I'm Aaron Parecki. Super excited to be here. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. I'm, this computer is on its way out the door, so it knows, and it's just trying to uh, give me a hard time here. So we're going to talk today about what's new with uh, OAuth 2.1 and talk about all the new things coming up in, in OAuth. I want to um, preface this by saying this is definitely like an early look at this. This is sort of a sneak peek. This is by no means final. So everything that I'm saying today, this is all in progress work in the OAuth working group. And there may be still some changes before it's finalized. Um, so I'm, I'm Eric Brecky. I work at Okta. I'm a senior security architect there. I do a lot of trainings on OAuth and security. And I'm also a member of the OAuth working group, which is actually where the specs are developed. The, um, I want to start with a little bit of background on OAuth 2, talk about how, how we got to where we are today, and then talk about kind of why things are changing and how. So OAuth 2 was originally published in 2012, which is a long time ago now. And that was published, um, it's called OAuth 2 because it was the second version of OAuth. It was, a, it was building on the original OAuth 1. The idea with OAuth 2 was is it was a completely breaking change. It was completely not compatible with OAuth 1. It renamed a lot of things. It, it completely changed the way a lot of it worked. And a lot of the reasons for it was because there were a lot of challenges with OAuth 1 that made it actually difficult or impossible to deploy in certain scenarios. So OAuth 2 started from scratch, rebuilt the whole protocol, and that's really what we've been building on since then. So quick summary of OAuth 2. It's actually a collection of a lot of documents, starting with the OAuth core document, RFC 6749. And this is the core document. This defines a handful of what are called grant types, which are ways to get an access token. And the end, at the end of all of these grant types, these are just different ways an app can negotiate with a server, with an OAuth server. And at the end of all of these flows, the result is the app has an access token. And the access token that it gets is called a bearer token. And technically, um, there are other, there could be other types of access tokens in an OAuth system because one of the early debates in the group was whether or not bearer tokens are a good idea. And bearer tokens are called bearer tokens because if you hold it, then you're the one that can use it. Anybody who is holding it is the one that can use it. Think of it like a key. If you pick a key up off the floor, you can go find the door that it works with and open it up. Now, this was a sort of controversial idea that bearer tokens being so much simpler than anything involving signatures or keys, um, but because it was so controversial, it actually got split out into its own RFC. So if you look at the core document, it doesn't actually say anything about access tokens. It just says, now an access token is issued, go read elsewhere about what that might look like. So bearer tokens are in 6750, which is the next RFC. And in that document, it talks about the fact that a bearer token is just a string as far as the application is concerned and that it can be used in an HTTP uh, request, things like that. It specifies a couple of different ways to use that token. So in a header, in the post body, as well as in a query stream. Now, one of these is a bad idea, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So when OAuth 2 was being developed and when it was finally published, mobile apps were actually still relatively new. So the iPhone came out in 2007, and that's when OAuth 2, OAuth 2 was started a little bit after that, but it wasn't really necessarily designed with mobile apps in mind. 
the experience on mobile was actually a lot worse than it is today. And there are a lot of different considerations when you deploy these kinds of systems in mobile apps. And what that meant is that things had to work a little bit differently in that environment. And that's also true with uh, the single page apps. We didn't call them single page apps back then, but the idea of a JavaScript application in a browser, um, you, you can't use a client secret, right? There's no way to deploy a client secret in a browser or in a mobile app and have it be secret. So we had to do things a little bit differently. So these, um, the, what the OAuth2 core did was define a sort of compromise flow, which was the uh, implicit flow, which was a, sort of a shortcut around the auth code flow when you didn't have a secret. And that's what was used by mobile apps as well as, as JavaScript apps for a long time. The problem with the implicit flow is that it's sending, it's, it's an entirely front channel based flow. What I mean by front channel is that it doesn't, there is no direct way for the OAuth server to talk directly to the OAuth client, which means you're actually using the browser to send data between those two pieces. So if the OAuth server is trying to get an access token to the browser, which is where the app is running, it actually has to go through the address bar in order to do that. That's the idea of using the front channel. And the problem is that you, if you think of it like throwing something over a wall, you can't actually see over the wall, which means you've got this problem of never actually being sure if it was successful. If you're sending it over the wall, you can't see if it's been caught, you can't see if it's been stolen or just fell on the ground. And on the other side of the picture, you can't actually be sure where it came from. You can't be sure if it's from the real OAuth server or from somebody else who threw something over the wall. So that's the reason for the implicit flow. Uh, the reason the implicit flow is, is sort of a problem because the access token is a thing being sent over the front channel. So this was, this became apparent pretty quick, and there was a sort of uh, a patch to, to fix this, which is called Pixie. And that was developed for mobile apps to be able to do the authorization code flow without a client secret. So there's this core document, Pixie, and then there's RC8252, which is a, a collection of recommendations for mobile apps doing uh, OAuth, one of those being saying it should do Pixie. There's a new app that's um, in progress still, which is actually one of the ones I'm writing, um, which is called uh, recommendations for browser apps, browser-based apps, and is it BCP stands for best current practice, which means uh, it's recommendations for how to do this in the most secure way in this environment. Now, this will say this also says things like browser apps should use Pixie because they can now, and you might be wondering, well, why couldn't we use Pixie from the very beginning? Well, the main reason is because browsers back then were very different and much more limited. And they actually didn't have this idea of cross-order resource sharing until a little bit while later. And this is sort of a necessary building block in order to do an authorization code flow where you're gonna be making a post request across domains. Thankfully, cross-order resource sharing is no longer a struggle. It's everywhere. So it's definitely a tool we can use. Which basically means that if we are talking about um, browser-based apps, being able to use the authorization code flow and mobile apps, then there isn't really any reason for the implicit flow to exist. Because the only reason it was there was because it was sort of a Band-Aid for browser apps. So thankfully, we can now sort of cross off the implicit flow since we don't need that sort of that less than ideal solution anymore. So there's another document being worked on in the group, which is called the um, security best current practice. And the security best current practice is a new document that talks about recommendations for all kinds of OAuth applications and servers. And it kind of rolls up a lot of the advice that we've learned in the last six or seven years of, of you know, deploying applications and writing, writing applications and building these new extensions. And it calls out a few things specifically. One of the things it says is don't use the implicit flow, it's not safe. It also says don't use the password flow. Because again, the password grant was actually in there as a migration strategy to upgrade to OAuth. It wasn't actually meant to be part of the OAuth framework. It was, it was there as an upgrade path. So let's take it out because if, if you're deploying OAuth, there's no, nobody's deploying password-based APIs anymore, right? You don't send passwords to APIs. So we don't need that upgrade path anymore. 
It also says that Pixie is required for even confidential clients because there's actually a pretty subtle uh, attack that's possible without Pixie, even if you have a client secret, like with confidential clients. Too much detail to go into right now, but if you're curious, search for the authorization code injection attack. And if you search for that on YouTube, on the Okta developer channel, you'll find some videos where we talk about that and do a demo of it. But the, the, the point is that Pixie solves that attack for confidential clients. So actually what that means is that every application should be doing Pixie. Okay, the last thing that the security VCP says is that passing access tokens in the query string is just a bad idea also, so let's take that off. I wanna talk about passwords for a minute. So I mentioned that the security BCP is taking it out of the spec. This is how it's doing it. It says the resource owner password credentials grant must not be used. There's no exceptions here. And the rest of this paragraph uh, is sort of a very concise description of why. But let's break this down. So it turns out that um, it was added to OAuth because it was a way to let applications upgrade from HTTP basic auth or using a stored password into OAuth. The idea was if an app was storing a password, it could exchange that by using the password grant for an access token and then forget the password. And now it's in, uh, now it's got the upgrade, you know, upgraded version to OAuth. So summary of the security BCP, which is sort of the collection of the best, best ways to do things. All OAuth clients must use Pixie. Don't use a password grant. Use exact string matching for redirect URLs. Don't pass access tokens in the query strings. There's some other recommendations around refresh tokens for public clients. So if there isn't a client secret, then a refresh token is extremely powerful because it can get new access tokens without the user being there. So it actually says that for public clients, those need to be sender constraint or one-time use. So we've got all this collection of stuff. Now, by this point, you're probably saying, this sounds really complicated. And yes, you're not wrong. There's a lot of things going on here. There's a handful of documents, a handful of RFCs. There's extensions left and right. There's stuff being done in other working groups, not even in the OAuth group. There's a lot going on. But one of the things I'm trying to do in the group is to sort of consolidate a lot of these best practices. So if you look at what we've got today, this is sort of the current state of OAuth where we've got these core grants, we've got these extensions over here, extensions building on top of extensions. But if you actually look at that, what we've got, it actually looks a lot more like this. It actually just says, well, everything should be using auth code plus Pixie. And then there's the client credentials grant. Let's drop the other two. And then there's two ways to use access settings. So it's actually a lot simpler than you might think once you actually read through all the docs and apply all that advice. So this is what OAuth 2.1 is meant to be. OAuth 2.1 is meant to be a consolidation of all of the best current practices into a new starting point, because I realize that it's not reasonable to ask people to read 10 years of RFCs in order to understand what OAuth 2 is. So by sort of redoing the new foundation, let's you know take all that, that knowledge, document in a new document, start there. So consolidating the OAuth 2 specs and the best practices, removing deprecated features, all to capture this under a new name. One of the other things it does is OAuth 2 actually leaves a lot of uh, room for extensions. So you'll see a lot of references in OAuth 2 to things like, you know, you could do this, this, or this, or here's a, here's a place where you can build new things. And a lot of that work hadn't happened yet. Well, over the last 10 years, a lot of that work has now happened. So we're not going to necessarily roll those all into the core, but we can now actually reference and say, here are some options for these extension points that exist. One of the explicit goals of OAuth 2.1, or rather non-goals, is it's not actually going to be adding any new behavior that isn't already des described in one of the existing specs. So nothing experimental, nothing that is not widely implemented. So what I mean by that is that if you are following OAuth 2 to the best current practice as documented today, that you already are doing OAuth 2.1. That's the idea. We're not trying to say you need to upgrade to OAuth 2.1 because if you are following the best practices, you are already doing that. 
So that's sort of, that's the summary. Um, one of the other things about OAuth 2.1 that I do want to mention is that there is a new term being introduced. And again, caveat this with this is still in progress work. Nothing is finalized, but this is what we're thinking. So in OAuth 2.0, you'll find the terms public client and confidential client. And public client is uh, sort of the single page app or mobile app anytime that the application code is running on a user's device where you couldn't ship a secret down to that because it wouldn't be secret anymore. They could just use the source code. Confidential clients are clients that are running on a server that can use a client secret. However, if you look at the spec, there's a few places where there's sort of like exceptions written into these two client types. So what we're doing is introducing a new term to capture those exceptions, which is called a credentialed client. And a credentialed client is an application that has a client secret, but whose identity isn't confirmed. So if you look at this uh, distinction in OAuth 2, it already exists. And again, we're not trying to, to we're not trying to add anything new. This the point is that this, this distinction does exist in OAuth 2, so we want to name it in OAuth 2.1. So if you look at the text from the spec, it says if the client type is confidential or the client was issued client credentials, then the client must authenticate. So what this means is that in OAuth 2, there already is this concept of a public client that might have credentials. So that's what we're naming. And now the sentence can be rewritten to say confidential or credentialed clients. And it's a lot cleaner. So the most common case where this would actually occur is a client that uses dynamic client registration to get a secret the first time it turns on. So it's a public client. It's you download it from the app store. The identity is not confirmed because anybody can run code that looks like that public client. First thing it does is it goes and gets credentials. Now those credentials identify that instance of that client securely throughout the rest of its life cycle. However, those credentials do not prove the identity of that app. Anybody could mimic that app just as well. So that's the distinction being made here. So the current status of this, this was recently adopted by the OAuth working group. That means it is now an official item in the group and um, we are actively looking for, for feedback and the intent is to publish this as an RFC at once we get through the process of editing and revising and addressing all the feedback. The link to the sort of summary is that oauth.net slash 2.1. And if you're interested in the actual RFC text, it's that link below. It's also linked from oauth.net. And this is the time to chime in. This is, uh, this is again, in progress work. If you have any thoughts about this or opinions or have any requests, this is the time to bring it up because this stuff is this is a group effort, this is a community effort. Everybody is just doing this because they, they want to be doing it. So with that, I hope that was a good overview of OAuth 2.1. I have more videos about this on the Okta Developer YouTube channel. I also um, have more links and resources available here. Um, OAuth.wtf is the link to copies of my book, or you can get uh, cast stickers there as well. So with that, Thank you very much. And I think I have some time for questions. Yes, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, yeah, really interesting. And again, um, like, uh, yeah, it's the time to chime in if if if, if you want to, uh, if the audience, at least some people are uh, security specialists or architects or developers or product managers wants to wants to come in. Uh, we have a question from Neil Casey. Uh, uh, is OS 2.1 backward compatible with OS 2? Yeah, so I kind of hinted at that um, towards the end yep. there, where I was saying that if you are following the best practices today, then that is what OAuth 2.1 is. So that said, OAuth 2.0 isn't even necessarily compatible with itself. So it's hard to say if OAuth 2.1 is backwards compatible, because it's very possible to build an OAuth 2 system that is not compatible with other OAuth 2 systems which is actually one of sort of the flaws of OAuth 2. So one of the things 2.1 is doing is actually narrowing a lot of those options. So it's more likely to be, to be compatible with other 2.1 systems. However, there's no guarantee that it's going to be backwards compatible, if that makes sense. It's, it's not changing anything, but because you can do so many different things in OAuth, it's very likely that someone who says they're doing OAuth 2 won't be compatible with 2.1 unless they upgrade it to follow the best practices of OAuth 2. Now, if you are, 
following the best practices of OAuth 2, that is 2.1. Okay, so let's say that's a, that's a, a let's say um, a, a, a packaged uh, a version of all of two uh, um, that 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 gather all the best practices, right? Can we say it like that? Yeah, if if you found a product that was that was you know OAuth two in the most secure way, and following all the best practices, and if you picked up an OAuth two point one client library, those should work. Yeah, that's okay. yeah. We have uh, another question. Uh, so that sorry, so that's the reason it's not OAuth three, like someone people yes. ask. Yeah, great, great point. That's why it's not OAuth three because it is meant to be mostly the same, the same stuff. Yeah, we have a question from Julia No More. Uh, what's the advantage of credentialed compared to confidential? The advantage. I don't know if I would call it an advantage. Uh, it's a difference. So. If you have the ability to deploy a confidential client, that's always going to be more secure. If you have the ability to use a client secret, then that is going to give you better security and better confidence in the system overall. Now, where this gets interesting is if you don't have that ability. So if you don't have the ability to deploy a client secret, that would be if you are shipping an app into an app store, that would be if you're shipping a single page app in a browser, shipping an app onto a smart device, like a smart TV or Internet of Things, all of those cases, you don't have the ability to securely deploy a client secret in those. So you can't con consider it a confidential client. In those cases, those could benefit from being credentialed clients by enrolling the first time they turn on, where you can't guarantee their identity, but at the very least, once they have a client secret, you can ensure that every call that app makes is the same app and hasn't been sort of clone or mimicking somebody else. We have a question uh, from uh, Jay Kumar. Uh, if we are using ROPC today, will it be not supported in the future that comes with OS 2.1? Yeah, that's definitely a good question. And there's sort of two ways to answer this. Um, if, you, if you read the OAuth 2 specs and the security best current practice, it says do not use the password grant. And the reason it says that is because it is trying to take it out of OAuth 2. Now, 2.1 actually doesn't mention the password grant. And the reason is because it's just not getting included. So that doesn't mean that it doesn't mean I'm trying to, I'm, I said this better in a podcast that's about to come out. So I might, I might defer to that. But what it means is um, if you want to extend OAuth 2.1 to add the password grant back in, that's up to you. Basically, what the OAuth group is saying is, we don't consider this to be a secure deployment of OAuth. So you're always free to do whatever you want, right? You can always build whatever you want to build. It's totally up to you. But you, you lose the benefit of the collective knowledge and security analysis of a larger community if you do things that that community does not recommend. Yeah, that's clear. Uh, we have a question from Savio. Uh, it is noted there are OAuth authorization servers who, who do not follow all the OAuth 2 standards. Would OAuth 2.1 help standardize this gap? I very much hope it does. That is um, sort of, it's not an explicit goal of 2.1, but I think it's a, uh, it's an, it'll be a side effect of it because a lot of what's in the security VCP, for example, does or tighten things up and reduce the number of options and reduce the number of different ways that you can do things, which is what leads to those, those gaps in interoperability. So by having fewer options, that will lead to more interoperable servers and, and clients. So I hope that does, in fact, happen. And by calling it 2.1, it means that if you're labeling your thing 2.1, now everybody knows that you're starting at this baseline, whereas with 2.0 right now, you can call almost anything OAuth 2.0 if you want, if you try hard enough. So, yeah. We have a question from Agul. I, I don't understand it well, but you may help me. Why does the header say Kafka? Because I missed half the session because of this. Maybe in your presentation, did you had a header mentioning Kafka or something? No, not in my presentation. Is it, are they talking about the, uh, the the website here, the the stage? Yeah, I don't know. That that's the question. And this is why. I, yeah. Okay. So Agul, if you uh, uh, Want to explain better your question? I will be ask, able to ask it again. So we have a question question from Robert. 
Uh, how will OAuth 2.1 impact OpenID Connect? Yeah, another good question. So one of the, so OpenID Connect is an extension of OAuth, OAuth 2. So it takes the OAuth 2 framework and then adds some stuff into it. One of the, so again, because the security BCP is saying, for example, don't use the implicit flow, actually what it's saying is don't return access tokens in the front channel. That does affect OpenID Connect in that if you want to deploy the most secure OpenID Connect flow, you should also not return access tokens in the front channel, which means there's a couple of the hybrid response modes of OpenID Connect that are essentially no longer a good idea. And there's um, that, that, but again, that's like if, if you're doing OpenID Connect and sort of not following the core best practices, you already have this sort of problem in your system. So it's a good idea to, to change that if you, you know, improve the security. Um, but as far as the, um, how it impacts the spec, it's a different group and it's up to that group to decide if they're going to publish any new guidance around it explicitly or just sort of rely on people understanding that it's sort of extending the same framework. We'll see how it goes. That still has yet to be played out. Um, we need to still um, finish more, you know, get more, make more progress on 2.1, I think, before we see any movement in the Open Connect extension. OK. so. Uh... So it seems that you know the OAuth has a like more than ten years history, with uh, some confusion at the time. But it seems this two point one is just trying to reduce the confusion as possible into the best practices, right? In the most secure one, is it is it the good sum up of, of two point one? Yeah, exactly. It's really meant to give people a clearer starting point when you're getting into OAuth and not have to not have to wade through that many different specs and try to interpret all of them. So hopefully, with any luck, if we're successful, it'll be much easier to get spun up on building OAuth libraries and OAuth servers, starting with OAuth 2.1 instead. Yeah, we have a question from Savio. Is OIDC equals OAuth 2 authorization code grant PKCE? So you definitely can do an Open eConnect flow using the authorization code grant with Pixie. This is like because Open ID Connect is built on top of OAuth, all of the same OAuth flows that exist, you can add in the Open ID Connect parts. The main thing that you're adding there is this idea that, of an ID token that communicates the user info to the application. So you can definitely add that part into the auth code flow with Pixie. And if you do that, that is the most secure way to do it. It has the fewest gaps and the fewest opportunities for leaks in, in the flow. Yeah, I think uh, we're we're out of time. Uh, but uh, did you see, uh, 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 Aaron, that actually you're maybe one of the session with the most question and people are really, really interested. So I think the all the group work is extremely important into like uh, making things simpler and providing the best practices into into one version. And I think this is exactly what, what you're doing. Uh, so thank you for uh, the presentation, but also for the work there. I think it's really needed right. in the, uh, for, for the whole industry. And again, if you want to join uh, the discussion, uh, you can uh, uh, you can join the all 2.1 uh, um, uh, working group discussions on, on the topic and get feedbacks uh, on this. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, Tanya says that yeah, on the Octa booth now uh, there will be a demo, uh, you know about about that stuff. Yeah, you so you're receiving some uh, some cheers, uh, Rawan. Thank you very much for being there. Uh, you'll always be uh, welcome at EPA days to talk about uh, all of and and its current. It's past, it's present, and it's future. Uh, Thank you. Hopefully, I can be there in person someday soon. Yeah, yeah, we all, we all of that uh, at some point.